All right, so today we're going to be working on uh, exponential functions. We're going to continue our work with that. And we are going to uh, introduce exponential decay. So in order to do that, I want to launch the lesson with this story about um, bumblebees, or this problem about, about bumblebees. Um, go ahead and take about 10 minutes and work through the front of this worksheet on your own. You can leave um, this box down here blank. I'll talk about that in the video. But for everything else, um, you can fill in the an or answer the questions and fill in the table and graph. So pause the video and take about 10 minutes to do this on your own. All right, now that you've had some time to do that, let's go ahead and talk through this together. It says the population of bumblebees in thousands since 1999 can be modeled by the equation blank. Complete the table and graph for this function. Label each axis. Okay, so when we look at this, we have P of T and T. So it looks like P is, is the population. So P is going to be the population. So if I'm doing that, that's going to be labeling my Y axis. So population... And what does it say in thousands? So this is in thousands. And then it says since 1990, which means the independent variable will be the number of years since 1990. So T represents the number of years since 1990. So if I go down here, number of years since 1990, okay? So now I go to um, my table, and if I want to start substituting values for t to fill in our table, we can do that. Um, let's just go ahead and do, well, it, if it's since 1990, I guess the t value that would make sense to start in is zero. That would be in the year 1990, zero years since 1990. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Um, so when I look at that, if I substitute in 0 here, 16 times 1 half to the 0 power, we haven't really talked about what it means to raise to the 0 power that much, so I'm going to skip that right now. Let's go to some exponents that we do understand. 16 times 1 half to the first, well 1 half to the first is just 1 half, and 16 times 1 half is 8. 16 times 1 half squared well, one half squared would be one fourth. One half times one half is one fourth. So 16 times one fourth is four. 16 times one half to the third. One half to the third would be one half times one half times one half, which would be one eighth. So that'd be 16 times one eighth, or just two. And we know that this equation is in exponential form, that y equals a times b to the x that we've been studying so far, this unit. So we know the pattern is, as x increases, or in this case t, as the independent variable increases at a constant rate, the y values, or the dependent variable, will um, change by a common factor or a common ratio, meaning the pattern we see will be multiplying or dividing by the same number. Now when I look at this pattern, I see it looks like we are dividing by 2 each time. But we know the common ratio is whatever you multiply by, and what we see in the equation is this common ratio is actually 1 half. So each time we really want to think of this as multiplying by 1 half. So if I continue that pattern, instead of evaluating each time, 2 times 1 half is 1. 1 times 1 half is just 1 half. 1 half times a half is 1 fourth. Now working backwards in the table, if I was work dividing my 2 to work forward, I could multiply by 2 to work backwards. That would be 16. Or if you're multiplying by 1 half to go forward, you could divide by half. But dividing by half is the same as multiplying by 2. So either way, you can think of it as you multiply by 2 to work backwards, which a lot of us recognize that this number out here is that y-intercept, that initial amount. And then that base, that base raised to the exponent, that's our common ratio, which we multiply. All right, so then if I were to plot these points, I've got to figure out what, how I want to label this. How many are there here? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I guess we could go every 2, say 1, 2, 3, 
four, five, six, seven. We'll fill in at least all of our table. And I bet it's 14 going up as well, which we want to get to that y intercept if we didn't do that. And I think the y intercept is important for us to see. So let's go ahead and go by twos here. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and so on. And then we can title our graph bumblebees. All right, so if I was to start plotting these points, I have 0, 16, that y-intercept. I have 1, 8. I have 2, 4. I have 3, 2, 4, 1. And I'm going to keep getting closer until I approach this x-axis. But I know that if I keep taking half of this, I'm going to keep getting smaller and smaller, but I'm never actually going to reach 0. So I start here, and let's draw this curve. I'll try and draw it as best I can. It'll keep going that direction, and it'll keep getting smaller and smaller. <coughs> um, but we'll never actually reach that x-axis, because if I keep taking half of something, I'm never going to get 0. So here's my table, and here's my graph. So now when I look at the questions, it says, describe what is happening to the population of bumblebees since 1990. Well, it seems to be decreasing, and because it's at a curve, it's decreasing at an exponential uh, rate. So I would say... The population of bumblebees is decreasing exponentially since 1990. And I say exponentially because we've looked at... Um, functions that have decreased it at a constant rate or a linear fashion, but this is definitely not linear. This is exponential. So what does the 16 mean in the context? So I look back at I had a 16 here, and what I do is I find that in the table right here. That's my initial amount. So what does the 16 mean? The 16 means the initial population of bumblebees, or because we're talking about years, in 1990, the population of bumblebees is, it's not 16, because remember 16, the units on here are thousands, 16,000. So there's 16,000 bumblebees in 1990. Next question says, what is the common ratio in the equation and explain its meaning in the context of the situation? Well, the common ratio, remember, is that is the base of the power, so it's being what's raised to the exponent, that's one half, or it's what we multiply each time. So the common ratio, that's what I have been doing in purple. The common ratio is one half. And what that means is each time, the, um, for every additional year, the population um, decreases by a factor of a half. So every additional year, the population changes by a factor, now I say a factor because that implies multiplication, of one half. What is the domain of this function? Now remember, domain are the outputs. No, no, sorry, the domain are the inputs or the x values. We don't have x values here, we have t values. So the domain of this function, um, well, Really, if I could continue this table going backwards, I can continue the pattern. But when we think of the context, the domain are the x values or the t values, and it starts at 0. So the domain starts at 0, and it doesn't say where it ends. So this maybe keeps going. There's no ending point. So from 0 to infinity. It includes 0 because we want to include that value there. And it goes all the way to infinity. Um, but we know we can never reach infinity, so we could write it like that. Or you could say t is greater than or equal to 0. Now, when we graph exponential functions and we don't do it in context, meaning there's not a story behind it, this could really go on forever. And we want to end at 0. We would go all the way to negative infinity. But in this context, um, it would make sense to start at 0. Then it says, what is the range of the function? Remember, the range are the outputs. In this case, that's our p of t, or the population. And so the outputs, or the range, 
Um, we think of the lowest value. Well, the lowest, it keeps going down until it gets really close to the x-axis. And at the x-axis, it would be zero. But if we just keep taking a half of stuff, we're never actually going to reach zero. So in this case, the lowest value we could say is almost zero. But because it doesn't actually reach zero, we'd have a parenthesis. The highest value, well, when we go up, um, it looks like the highest value we have is 16. That's where we start. So the highest value is 16. We actually hit 16, so you would include that. Um, if, again, if there was no story, then this would keep going, and then it would go up to infinity. But there is a story, there is a context, and so it makes sense to stop at 16 is the highest. If you wanted to write that as an inequality, we have to have a compound inequality. Zero, less than t, not equal to, because we're never going to reach that x-axis. Less than or equal to 16, because we actually hit 16. Sorry, this is not t. This is p of t. Okay, or our y values, our outputs. Now, I want to talk about this before we move on to f and g. Um, when we talk about the range, and we're talking about this function is approaching the x-axis but never actually reaches it, there's a special name for the line that a graph, an exponential function approaches but never crosses, and that is called an asymptote. Um, so if I draw that in, that's a dashed line. I use a dashed line because it helps us to see what we are um, talking about without actually being a part of the function. So this is called the asymptote. And in this function, the equation of the asymptote would be y equals 0. It's a horizontal line um, where y is 0. And we're going to talk more about asymptotes later, but that will help us when we're um, trying to analyze the domain and range. All right, so let's get you now for f. How would the equation change if the population of bumblebees was decreasing by only 35% each year? Well, let's think about this. If the common ratio is a half, we divide by 2, um, and we want to think through, like, well, what is the percentage that we're decreasing then? Well, if we go to 8 to 4, half of that, we're decreasing by 50%. So currently, we are decreasing by 50%. It wants to know, what if we only decrease by 35%? And this is where we want to use some of the knowledge we have from the last couple days. We were talking about increasing by percentages. Remember, when you increase by a percent, you have that 1 plus whatever that percentage is. But when we're decreasing, we're going to do 1 minus that, because you're not increasing by that percent, we're de decreasing by that percent. So if you think about this 1 half, you could think of this as y equals 16 times 0 0.5 raised to the t. And how we get that 0 0.5 is by doing 1 minus the 50%. 50% as a decimal is 0.5. So this is where we get that 0 0.5. If we go down here, how would the equation change if the population of bumblebees was decreasing by 35%? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then we would still have that 16 that we're starting with, that 16,000. We'd have one, instead of decreasing by 50%, we're decreasing by 35%. 35% as a decimal would be 0 0.35 if I move that decimal place over twice. So minus 0 0.35 raised to the t. And if I simplify this, I get y equals 16 times 0 0.65 raised to the t. Which essentially means that every year only 65% remain. If I decrease by 35% each year, only 65% remain. So this is what that simplified equation would be. This is where I want to talk about some vocab here. Um, there's, we talk about exponential growth and decay, and there's uh, growth and decay factors and growth and decay rates. So I want to talk about the difference between those two right now. So a growth factor or decay factor is whatever the common ratio is. That's that right there. Just another word for common ratio. So up here, the growth or decay factor was, or sorry, in this case, the decay, decay factor was one half or 0.5. But the growth or decay rate is the percentage by which the function is increasing or decreasing. So in that case, this, whatever 1 minus, whatever you're subtracting, that is the rate. So that is our rate. I'll underline that. Whereas this is our factor. And that can be confusing for students. So when you look it down at this example, Go ahead and try and figure out what is the um, growth or decay 
actually first figure out is this growing or decaying and why do you think um, based on the equation and what is the factor and what is the rate at which we are growing or decaying pause the video and try and figure that out right now all right so now that you've had some time to process this on your own remember this is our y-intercept this is our initial amount our common ratio is this right here and remember, we said another word for common ratio is growth or decay factor. So we've got to figure out, are we growing or decaying? And this is really where we're going to start talking about for G. Now, if I only see a 0.4, it means the following year, there's only 0.4 left. So if I multiply a number by 0.4, that's going to decrease it. So think about this. If I have 10 initially, 10 times 0.4 will decrease it to just 4. And if I multiply by 0.4 again, I keep getting smaller. So 0.4 is going to, if I multiply by 0.4 each time, it causes the values to decrease. So the uh, function is exponential decay, and the decay factor is 0 0.4. The decay rate, well remember, you get your rate by 1 minus whatever that rate is. So 1 minus something gives us the 0.4. So I'm thinking, what am I subtracting from 1 in order to get 0.4? So some of us can do mental math, and that's fine. You can also think of it as 100% minus the rate is equal to 0.4 would be 40%. So what do I have to subtract from 100% to get 40%? Um, or you could solve that linear equation. Bottom line is the rate ends up being 60%. So you are decreasing by 60%. So the decay rate would be 60% here. So just some vocab to talk about. I want to go back to G now. It says, how could you look at an equation of an exponential function and know whether or not the function was increasing or decreasing exponentially? And when we're increasing, that means that it's exponential growth. And when we say decreasing exponentially, that would be exponential decay. So we started talking about it. Expon, oh, put a couple more. Exponential decay. We started talking about a little bit here with the growth and decay factors and rates. <coughs> um, and you can think of this a couple different ways. If you think of it as decreasing where you're subtracting the rate, anytime I take 1 and I subtract something from it, I'm going to have a value that's less than 1. When we were increasing, we would add that rate and we'd have a value greater than 1. So we're going to have decay when we're that common ratio or the factor is less than 1 growth or increasing when that common ratio or that value is greater than one. A different way to think about it is that, you know, with exponential functions, your pattern in the table is that you're multiplying. So we're multiplying by something. Well, when you multiply by something and you want it to get smaller, you've got to multiply by something less than one. If I want to make it bigger, I'm multiplying, something, um, I'm multiplying that number by something greater than one. So here, exponential growth is going to happen um, when the common ratio is greater than 1. And this is when the common ratio is less than 1. Not only does it have to be less than 1, it also has to be greater than 0. And the reason we say greater than 0 is because you multiply by a negative number, um, then it ends up making it positive, the negative, positive, the negative, um, which we're just not going to address in this class. We're not graphing anything that has, or dealing with any context where the common ratio would be negative. So this is the difference between growth and decay when you're looking at an equation. What I want us to do next is to um, do a team pair solo and identify whether there's exponential growth or exponential decay when we look at the function. So this started our conversation. We're going to continue the practice with a team pair solo. So what I want you guys to do is to turn to the next page. You have these three team problems and then the pair problem and then solo problems. So for each one of these, you're determining whether the function represents exponential growth, exponential decay, or neither, and you are explaining why. Um, there's also some questions in bold, so if you finish before the rest of the group is ready to go over it, answer those questions in bold. It'll continue getting you prepared for your quiz and uh, ultimately your test over this, uh, these problems. So you'll have about five to ten minutes to work on the team problems. Um, same thing for the pair problems, the same thing for the solo. Um, what we want to do is take about five minutes to do the team problems um, in groups of four. We'll show you the answers and then make any corrections you need to, have people help you to try and figure out what the um, 
correct answer is or why we get the correct answer if you didn't figure it out on your own. They don't have five minutes to do the pair problems. Pairs, remember, you take your team of four, split up into two pairs of two. Do that again, check your answers. And then after that, we're all gonna separate and we're gonna work silently and independently on the solo problems and see, can we do these types of problems on our own? All right, good luck.